how much does your thinking of the need to reform the uh, international financial system, financial system owe to, to, to the financial and economic crisis of 2008? Well, the crisis of 2008 uh, forced us to consider um, the role of uh, international organizations as well as the role of public intellectuals uh, in addressing the conditions uh, which led to the crisis as well as in uh, mobilizing opinion, public opinion, to respond to the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and so 20, 2008 was, was important, but uh, I come from Southeast Asia and we had a severe crisis in 1997-1998 and uh, in many ways, I had the fortune of going to university in the early and mid-1970s at a time when uh, Keynesianism uh, was uh, under uh, increasing attack. Uh, so I had uh, a semi, a quasi-Keynesian education uh, as an economist, uh, but I was very mindful of the very severe strains Keynesian economic thinking was coming under. Uh, there was also a very strong relationship between Keynesian economic thinking and development economics. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, uh, the post-war period was characterized uh, by the rise of both and almost a simultaneous demise of Keynesian economic thinking and development economics uh, from around, uh, roughly from around the late 1970s uh, into the early 1980s. Uh, so I have been very mindful of uh, the systemic character of the uh, world economy and I have uh, been thinking about it both in terms of challenges of economic stability, which, uh, which is what uh, a lot of Keynesian economics is about, as well as the trying to foster the conditions uh, to, uh, for economic development on the one hand, but also to try to uh, create a much more, uh, a much less unequal world, let me put it that way. So, so the 2008 crisis was a trigger, but uh, not necessarily the main trigger of your uh, latest thinking on the need to reform the international financial system. Then you, 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 you just talked about uh, um, public intellectuals. Why was why why was you know the the role the lack of of, of role of of public intellectuals in the context of the two thousand eight crisis an issue for you? Well, the defeat of uh, of um, Keynesian economic thinking over the last over the preceding three decades. Uh, was a very important contributor. The rise of uh, what is popularly termed neoliberal economic thinking in place of uh, Keynesian economic thinking uh, basically meant that uh, intellectual endeavors uh, among economists were no longer uh, counter-cyclical, but they tended to be pro-cyclical. In other Ooh, words, creating, mean, yes. creating conditions which uh, contributed to booms but also to bus. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so instead of uh, trying to ensure a boom does not contribute to a bubble, uh, 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 economists uh, did much less of that. Uh, instead, they wanted to try to s make as much as possible from a boom mm -hmm. uh, without worrying about the consequences of the bus which would follow. So we have had a much more volatile and unstable world economy uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, Keynesian economic thinking uh, was very concerned uh, about trying to ensure a much more balanced, a much more counter-cyclical approach. So whenever you had a boom which threatened to create a bubble, you tried to prick the bubble to make sure that the boom doesn't get out of hand and lead to bubbles which would create a, a lot of problems and which would inevitably lead to a subsequent bust. Uh, this, was a this has been a preoccupation for a very, very long time. Uh, but I think in the last three decades, during the period of what uh, the neo many liberal economists call the great moderation, mm 
there was this uh, feeling of, of that somehow or other the business cycle had disappeared, that uh, cyclical movements had disappeared, that boom and bust cycles had disappeared, and that it was possible to get into a permanent state of indefinite expansion. And so that, that's what you, you, you called the, 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 the public intellectual's problem, if you will. The, the, the fact that public intellectuals, economists and commentators somehow uh, gave up on trying to uh, think about the conditions for a stable economic order at the international level. Yes, I think uh, this was a, a very major problem among mm. in, in the profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, pr the profession also became uh, a, a bit of a monoculture. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, much less uh, contention uh, within the uh, profession uh, and it was only the, the devastation of the crisis which created the conditions for the few dissident voices to get a more prominent space after the crisis. To be sure, this problem was especially serious uh, in the United in States, the US, yes. uh, but to some extent the United States had become so intellectually hegemonic mm -hmm. in the economics profession uh, throughout the world uh, that one cannot claim that it was a pu yeah. uh, uh, owned and exclusively American phenomenon. And, and do you feel that uh, this monoculture, uh, when it comes to the academic field of, uh, of economics and beyond this, when it comes to the public discourse on economics, somehow has, has changed a bit in the past uh, three years or so? I think the immediate uh, quarter months or quarters after the crisis happened, uh, perhaps even up to a year, saw uh, what I have referred to as a Keynesian moment or a Bretton Woods moment, when people were prepared to rethink, to question very, very fundamentally, to question very systemically uh, what had gone wrong. Uh, but with the so-called green shoots of recovery from the second half of 2009 uh, and the uh, subsequent preoccupation with sovereign debt problems in Europe especially and the emphasis on fiscal austerity as the way forward uh, we have seen the, the, the loss of that Keynesian moment mm -hmm. and unfortunately what we are likely to see is a period of relatively slower growth um, part of the reason is that uh, much of the world has now is now much more internationally economically integrated. So if there are no longer external markets to which they can export, uh, then growth is less likely to occur. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, right now, if you look at the growth plans of uh, economies, both big and small, almost everybody uh, expects to grow by exporting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, this cannot happen no. in a world. <laughs> you know, we, no, but if we, we, the, th the sum of yeah. exports mm -hmm. has to equal the sum of imports. Mm -hmm. uh, although it seems that uh, a few days ago we were talking to uh, we were talking with an economist uh, from China, and he was telling us that somehow the strategy of uh, of the Chinese go uh, the Chinese government in terms of certain growth uh, is destined to change a bit. I mean, they are going to try to somehow uh, have a growth. Uh, uh, internally generated and less geared towards export. Is it the case? Uh, yes, uh, it, it is true that China has has has, uh, has uh, made a strong commitment to, towards uh, becoming much more domestically oriented. Uh, but China is exceptional. It is a large economy yeah. which has potentially a, a large domestic market and that large domestic market is being fostered uh, by a combination of increased government spending on the one hand and uh, a redistribution of income. Uh, wages in China had not gone up as much as pro productivity for decades, mm -hmm. but now we've seen a significant uh, increase in wages. And also very importantly, the renminbi uh, is uh, appreciating in value. And with the appreciation of value of the renminbi, we are going to see a very uh, you know, uh, we are going to see a China which is much more domestically oriented in terms of its production. Just so, to, to go back to the issue of the uh, financial crisis of 2008, what kind of shortcomings uh, were unveiled in the context of this uh, crisis regarding the international financial system? And uh, how did these shortcomings unveil in the context of the crisis uh, where uh, 
um, an addition to to more perennial mm. uh, shortcomings. So mm. first of all, the, the 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 shortcomings revealed by 2008, and how do they how did they adapt to pre-existing shortcomings? Okay, there is a tendency in the popular media and in the pop in the public imagination to focus on the abuses, on the corruption, etc., which has been taking place. And this is certainly true. There has been there has been a lot of abuse, and there has been a lot of corruption, uh, and so on. But focusing exclusively on corruption and abuse does not allow us to recognize and reform the systemic character of the problem. Because even if there was no corruption and abuse, there would still have been a problem. And we cannot attribute the problem simply to, to corruption and abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, uh, so while we must acknowledge that there was a lot of corruption and abuse, uh, we must also recognize the systemic uh, character. Now, I would like to focus on two aspects. One, the policies. And as I have emphasized earlier, what we have seen in the last uh, three decades or so, uh, 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 less of a concern with, uh, with, uh, with having uh, balanced growth, of having sustainable, sustained growth, of, uh, of, uh, of ensuring stability and less volatility. Um, uh, this, this is a big major problem of, of policy and especially among the largest economies. The second uh, uh, major problem uh, is that many of the institutions which had once been created as safeguards for the system uh, uh, changed in character or became less effective and less uh, and so we have seen that their ability uh, to check against uh, these these problems uh, 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 was was compromised by by the this transformation. So you have a pol problem with policies, you have a problem with institutions, and you have a problem, uh, a re a related problems of, a, of the diminished role of government, the diminished capacity of government, and uh, the, re the reliance uh, on uh, private, uh, on the private sector, on, on what is essentially greed, mm -hmm. uh, 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 as as mediated through the market uh, in ensu in ensuring the public uh, interest, mm -hmm. and this of course was a disastrous recipe. Yeah. So in a way, you are saying that uh, in two thousand, in the context of two thousand eight, we saw some extreme behaviors, uh, but in fact, uh, the the framework in which these extreme behaviors took place, and the the the, the problem the shortcut shortcomings they they expressed predated uh, two thousand eight. And in fact, had to do with uh, what had been the policies and the changes in the nature of institutions uh, in the pr three previous decades. So now, in in terms of the you 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 so you mentioned uh, the, the the policies and the, uh, the 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 changes which took place in in the nature of the institutions, I guess at the international level and at the national level. But of course, these changes uh, echoed uh, the policies which were favoured. The the, the, mm. the the fact that uh, the nature of uh, of uh, of, institution, of these institutions at the international level at the, at the national level with less government and so on you know the fact that we, they couldn't play anymore this uh, uh, guarantor role I guess was in line with the policies which were favoured the neo neoliberal policies or not not necessarily um, by and large you are correct however I I I, I think we should never forget the significance of inertia, okay. uh, of institutional inertia. You know, uh, institutions and even policies do not simply move uh, in lockstep uh, as, as the overall direction uh, and uh, uh, public priorities, uh, public policy priorities change. Uh, there's always there are always uh, elements of inertia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the elements of inertia may be uh, public come from public opposition. It may come from uh, uh, tr tradition. Uh, it may come from conflicts of interest. It may come from many many sources. Uh, so sometimes uh, those things uh, do. Uh, 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 serve as count countervailing elements. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Uh, despite all the efforts, uh, many of the poorest countries, 
were not really integrated into the uh, international economy. Uh, this meant that they were that they were largely bypassed in many economic transactions and relations, but it also meant that the full blast of the crisis did not really yeah. hurt them. Uh, but they were hurt indirectly because what happened in, during the crisis was that there was uh, a freezing of, uh, of, uh, of credit, including credit for trade. So in many African ports, for example, you find uh, that the raw materials were piling up, they were ready to be exported, but the underlying bills of lading and the other kinds of economic transactions were no longer moving very smoothly because uh, credit was no longer available on the terms it was previously available. So you you can see here that that you know things are not are not smooth. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that the, 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 the system, if you will, is full of of elements which uh, which uh, which are not necessarily synchronized very effectively. Mm -hmm. You cannot think of the system uh, like a like a Swiss watch, which is working. Mm -hmm. All the parts are, are perfectly uh, fitted to each other. Mm -hmm. and, and and when you mentioned the fact that uh, a number of institutions, uh, uh, I mean, the nature of a number of institutions uh, change and s they, they, they they stopped. Uh, they simply stopped uh, playing uh, a, a role of grantor. Can you give us some example? I mean, uh, you, you, what are the what are the institutions that you have in mind? Well, the, the World Bank, the IMF. Uh, uh, let, 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 let me think. Let me just mention. A, well, I've already mentioned one yes. example that. Uh, the uh, uh, trade finance yes. uh, was no longer available. Mm -hmm. Trade finance is largely provided uh, by private sources. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it doesn't really involve very many public sources, except a few uh, export-import banks and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but th those sources f uh, squeeze, uh, you know, froze up, and uh, they have ad adversely affected the poorest countries. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, credit lines provided by the IMF, mm -hmm. who does the IMF provide credit lines to? Uh, usually, uh, credit lines are provided not only by the IMF but by most fi most financial institutions to those who least need it. Yeah. Okay, so there is a tendency, therefore, why uh, to, to those who, who, who least need it? Because their credit rating is highest. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and and so that so for example you have uh, some interesting new uh, credit facilities which were provided by the IMF, uh, but they were not being extended to those countries uh, who were in greatest trouble, mm -hmm. who needed the credit most. Uh, now there are very sound economic reasons for it, yeah. but you can see that the system that these institutions, which are supposed to 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 protect the system uh, and to be a very ma ma to provide many uh, important countervailing uh, uh, safeguards uh, uh, simply do not uh, function as they yeah. are uh, expected to. Mm -hmm. And 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 so you 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 mentioned that uh, uh, the, the the problems uh, which appeared to be at the core of the 2008 crisis, in fact. Uh, were simply uh, taking place uh, in continuation of more systemic problems. So if you had uh, to make a, a list of these systemic problems, what, what would you have in, in the list of these systemic problems? Because since now you are focusing on reforming the international system, I guess that uh, this is uh, uh, a book about recommendations, about principles, about uh, values and ideas meant to rectify and correct mm -hmm the systemic problems uh, uh, which you see still affecting the international system in terms of finance. So what, wh what are in your view the, the systemic problems? Okay, let, let me put, I'll try to answer this question a bit historically. Mm -hmm. When the crash happened in 1929 and uh, the world recession took place in, in the 1930s, uh, there was no attempt to, to reform the international monetary and financial system until 15 years later, 1944. And this was combined with a political effort to reform inter international, uh, international multilateralism. Uh, 
Basically, President Roosevelt recognized that multilateralism under the League of Nations had basically failed. And he wanted to create a new system. And that's why the Bretton Woods Conference was called the United Nations uh, Conference on Monetary and Financial Affairs, which created the conditions. Now, when he contacted Winston Churchill about this conference, Churchill said, oh, why don't we just get together and solve these problems? We don't have to bother with the rest of the world. The world is at war. But Roosevelt insisted, and 44 countries met for a month in Bretton Woods to create... Of course, we know the names of the stars, Keynes and, and uh, Dexter White and so on. But the other, four, the other 42 countries were not insignificant. And the fact that there were 29 countries, which would today be called developing countries there, mainly, of course, from Latin America, but also some from Africa and Asia, meant that these interests were not unrepresented. And it was possible for them to ensure that there were some safeguards at, the incep at inception. Now, unfortunately, in 1971, after a series of crises, uh, particularly toward, uh, uh, culminating with the huge American military expenditure for the Vietnam War, um, the Americans were not able to meet their obligations under the original Bretton Woods arrangements, and the Bretton Woods system came to an end at the beginning of the 1970s. Since then, for the last four decades, we have been living with what my old professor, Professor Robert Triffin, called a non-system. So to think of the situation which has existed in the last four decades as a system is actually a misnomer. It's, 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 it's a misnomer. It is uh, the system which was created with all its faults and imperfections in Bretton Woods in 1944 was dismantled in 1971. And since then, the world, what we, what we often refer to as a system is actually the, uh, the culmination of a, of a series of ad hoc accretions, okay, of cumulative accretions. You know? So to think of that as a system, it, it, it seems to me, is, is, is to exaggerate yes. its systemic character. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah? So this is what we have. And, and so, no. what are the main characteristics of this non-system, which amount to shortcomings? Well, the biggest problem, I think, is that the world after 1944 was conceived of as a world with limited flows of capital be among countries, for better or worse. This mm -hmm. was the view of the designers of Bretton Woods. In the what, last, what, what was the advantage of limited flow of capital? That the f it was envisaged that the flow of capital would that the flow of finance would be related to payments, okay. so it would be related to trade. Okay, uh, it, basically, today we have a situation where more than ninety eight percent of cross border transactions have got nothing to do with trade. So they have to do with what? What's, well, what's the, what's what, the incentive? What's what the, the public often refers to as speculation, mm -hmm. hot money flows, and so on and so forth. And why is it, I mean, I'm, I'm asking you silly questions, but uh, first of all, because I don't know the answers, and also for the audience, I mean, why is uh, this kind of uh, delinking or, or lack of link between uh, uh, capital flows and, 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 and trade, why is it a bad thing? It is a bad thing because it is extremely disruptive, it is often in search of very short-term profitability, but with devastating collateral damage to this, to 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 uh, to for economic, financial, and economic mm -hmm. stability. It is not just the amount of money which is available, but the possibility for financial institutions to leverage further, mm -hmm. which increases the amount of cross-border flows which take place all the time. So, for example, many so-called emerging market economies, developing economies today, are facing the problem of the value of their currencies going up tremendously because people do not want to keep their money where they used to keep their money before. Mm -hmm. Why? 
because they see a world where the US dollar might be coming down or some other currency is expected to come down. So what do you do? You move your money to the southern hemisphere uh, to, to uh, you know, and, and this causes the, 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 those countries are unable to, to, to deal with these huge inflows of funds. Now, under the International Monetary Fund's Articles of Agreement, under what is called Article 6, Section 3, a country has a right to manage financial flows, uh, capital flows. Mm -hmm. Okay, And in fact, in the world today, there are uh, 193 countries, if you include South Sudan, uh, 185 are members of the IMF, but and 100, more than 140 actually do have some kind of controls. But the ideology of capital markets or financial markets is such that you're not supposed to have any controls. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to minimize these controls. And so even though countries formally have the right to have these controls, they either do not exercise this right mm -hmm. or they are in denial about their rights. And so wh wh how is the argument made that in fact the control of capital is not a good thing? Why is it that uh, countries for which it would be in their interest to somehow control capitals end up knowing, not doing so because it is the ideology of the time? In a, uh, w w how is the case being made let me, let me in, give in you an example. policy and intellectual terms? Let me, let me give you an example. If you, if you were a finance minister, of a country, uh, a transitional economy, or a Latin American developing country, and you spoke loudly and insisted on your right to have controls on capital, on capital flows, uh, you would never be elected finance minister of the year by mm -hmm. any finance magazine or business journal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. This is, the, this is the court of so-called public opinion, but it is not a court where the jury is not pre-selected. The jury is, is, considers the free flow of capital to be desirable, and that anybody who challenges that to, be, to not recognize what is in the best interest of the world economy, etc., etc. So, but, but so, so why, um, once, uh, so I understand that it is the ideology of the time, and and that's, uh, what is the intellectual argument uh, behind uh, free flow of capital is a good thing. I mean, you know, what are the the the, the, the uh, benefits? Ah, the, 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 you know, the, 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 how do we make the case? The benefit is supposed to be the following: if you have a free flow of capital, f capital would flow from the capital rich countries, mm -hmm. namely the rich countries to the capital poor countries. But we have known for decades that, that this is untrue. Yeah? In fact, for example, before the crisis, half the flows of capital were to the United States. Mm -hmm. Developing countries got less than 20% of the flows of capital. And even that, it was a small handful of developing countries which got most of the capital inflows. And developing countries in general were net exporters of capital in increasing amounts over the last three decades. Okay? So ev even uh, the, the uh, conservative uh, economist, uh, uh, Professor Lucas, mm -hmm. uh, referred to it, and it, it, the term has come about, uh, called the Lucas paradox of capital flowing uphill. Okay, because it didn't go from the capital rich to the capital poor, but from the capital poor to the capital rich. So, so the idea was that uh, uh, capital flows uh, supposedly is going to go from rich country to poor countries, and in the process is going to be a strategic tool for the development of these poor countries. Yes. In fact, it is not happening. Yes. And it is not happening because, in fact, this uh, uh, capital is looking for the best deal in town, yes. uh, which is not aligned with, in fact, uh, uh, long-term investment, which is about strategic development, right? Yes. So, so it's a problem both in developing countries and in developed countries. It's also a problem in developed, developed countries. countries. Yes. So, so it seems quite reasonable to think along these lines. So why is it that we 
we don't seem to see the light? Or why is it that for so many decades we haven't seen the light on this issue? For ideological reasons. Mm -hmm. This is why, why I emphasize the failure of the public intellectuals. Yes. Yeah, because public intellectuals could have spoken out about this. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Lucas, for example, did recognize this a long time ago. But still, we never heard economists recognizing this emphatically and therefore influencing public policy to say this is a sham. This is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Capital is co not going to flow from the capital rich to the capital poor. It's flowing in the opposite direction. And this is not something which is in the benefit to be benefiting these countries. Also, the other sham was that this capital which was flowing was usually flowing for very short-term purposes. Yes. Okay? It was often flowing for speculative purposes. If, we, if I could make money by bringing money into your country, in the morning and taking it out in the evening, I would do so, yes. you know. And and the, the the idea was not to go into your country and invest and build uh, whatever was needed in your country. No, this was not the intention. It was never the intention. So this this cult of of the free flow of capital uh, was something which was which people still believe in today, despite all the evidence to the contrary. And so this is one of the key systemic shortcomings of the of the current system. Any other uh, systemic problems besides, or is it really the central one? I would say that as, as one of the problems, but I wouldn't say it's the only problem. There are, the, we, the, the key development which, uh, which has changed things to a great extent, especially in this country, in the United States, is the the uh, there used to be what people call a Chinese wall between commercial banking and what in the US is called investment banking or the British call uh, merchant banking. This wall has basically disappeared. And this has basically allowed the high leveraging of capital which we find in the world today. And why Professor, uh, uh, Mr. Volcker, the former US uh, Fed, uh, uh, he, he has been so uh, unhappy about what has happened in the last few decades. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I mean, he, is, he, he again is, is, uh, is, quite, is very conservative you know, in terms of his views, but he feels that this is very reckless very dangerous, mm -hmm. the kind of the elimination of this kind. So he is very much in favor of regulation. And we w were in a period in the last few decades of, of, of not recognizing the virtues of regulation. Of course, regulation is always very difficult. And the moment you create regu uh, regulations, there will always be people trying to circumvent those regulations. But nevertheless, regulations have been important in terms of providing checks and balances. Mm -hmm. What we find is that the ideology of deregulation and sometimes self-regulation came in place of the older preference for regulation. And so, it, so we find that, that major financial institutions, what are sometimes called strategically important financial institutions, were left to regulate themselves. And very often, they were recognized, they were seen as too big to fail, mm -hmm. yeah? as strategically important, and so on and so forth. So gov when they failed, governments were compelled to put in tens of billions, if not more, to save these you institutions. See, yeah. mm -hmm. And this is the major source of the sovereign debt Okay. which has expanded in many of the so-called so pigs in, in Europe. But isn't it paradoxical? Because on the one hand, you are telling us that this uh, strategically important uh, financial institutions, essentially private institutions, somehow were you know, following uh, uh, investment policies which were highly speculative uh, and therefore not contributing to the development uh, or only in the margins of, you know, both developing countries and developed uh, and developed countries, in the process created a huge systemic risk without offering uh, a systemic service 
so to speak, and yet, you know, afterwards, uh, you know, the, 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 the losses are being socialized. So they don't uh, act as uh, responsible social actors, and yet uh, we, we have to, you know, regular citizens be then responsible social actors towards them. Sure. Isn't it a bit of a, a difficult predicament for everybody? Well, we can call that the Quaco paradox. <laughs> no, 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 but it's of course, bit, uh, of course. Of because course. you know, in, in the end, you know, one of the key uh, sources of legitimacy for for the, the the private sector as well as for the banking system is somehow to to, to provide. Uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 I guess they have to make money, but uh, beyond this, they have to provide services. Uh, for the society and for the people. Yes. And short of doing this, their legitimacy uh, is undermined. Of course. You see, what, what was the problem was, the f was partly the following. You had a situation, for example, in the United States before the crisis, you had a situation where the financial sector accounted for 12-15% of, of assets, but it accounted for 40% of profits. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are profits after the the huge remuneration for the those who 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 uh, who, who ran these institutions, and let us not forget many corporations which started off with as as institutions in the real economy were tempered by the possibilities for huge financial gains to transform themselves. So if you think of Enron, for example, mm -hmm. Enron started off as an energy corporation, but it ended up as a financial conglomerate with an energy focus. Mm -hmm. Now, one can think of a number of other institutions, but I will not mention yeah. them right now. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the problem was that with the greater and greater share of the wealth, what Keynes used to call these rentiers became extremely rich, but they also recognized the need to buy influence. And they were able to buy influence in all the major capitals of the world, and therefore, and to, to have influence uh, through the media, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Look at the rise of the business media in recent, yes. in recent mm -hmm. decades. So they, were, they, were, they, they had a powerful influence not only in the realm of what was happening in the, in the world, in the in economy, but also over ideas, mm. and this is very, but, but, very important. But what is surprising, what you're saying, that is somehow uh, the, the way these organizations were uh, operating was such that uh, they, uh, they led the systemic risk to increase uh, further and further, and at the same time, their ability to conceive of and generate a systemic service for society, uh, for development, and so on and so on, uh, which is a key source of their legitimacy, and we you know, somehow uh, shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And, 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 and we, we, you know, in the context of the uh, 2008 crisis, we have talked a lot about the systemic risk, but we really haven't focused much on what these uh, private operators owe to society as a way for them to be legitimate operators. Mm. I mean, what yeah. I call a systemic service. Yes, well... Uh, Why is it that we are so somehow forgot we have forgotten this uh, other side of the equation? Well, it is not that we have forgotten them, but this is now considered boring banking. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, the role, the important role of financial intermediation, which which is what the the financial sector was was meant to to do, mm -hmm. this is now considered to be boring. It is, not con it is not considered to be very to be hugely profitable, and one of the chapters in this volume pre makes precisely that argument. If the private financial sector considers the basic role of financial intermediation to be boring and not sufficiently profitable, perhaps this is a there is a strong case to be made for a nationalized core of the banking system yeah. to, to, to to provide th that those key role that key role. And so, so, so these are some of the key problems uh, that you identify in the in the financial system: uh, capital flows, lack of regulation, leverage, uh, uh, systemic risk without uh, the delivery of a systemic service. So then, so this is your diagnosis. So then, wh what are your recommendations? 
uh, in the book. I mean, how do we uh, overcome intellectually and uh, and in policy and uh, and in institutional terms this kind of uh, dire situation? So well, in the book, yes. you know, how do we go beyond this? Uh, this situation. Well, this is an edited volume. Yes. Okay. So we we speak. Yeah, we speak about this through 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 the different authors. Yes. And uh, I've already mentioned, for example, the importance of uh, the pos importance of a nationalized banking uh, system. And f uh, we've talked earlier about the importance of capital controls, but appropriate capital controls, which would be able to attract um, funds, which would strengthen the real economy. Either loans or uh, uh, or, or uh, investments, which would uh, help to 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 enhance capacity. This would be needed, in, especially in the very poorest of economies. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, there are a number of systemic and policy uh, features which need to be which need to be changed. We need to create an institutional context which would be consistently counter-cyclical. So what, what is called counter-cyclical these days basically is to reflate the economy when you have a downturn. Yes. Okay? That is, of course, very important. Mm -hmm. But you must also be able to resist temptation during the boom. So prevention. Yes. You have to be able to to contain the bubbles, you have to basically uh, prick the bubbles before the bubbles uh, uh, grow and are capable of causing even greater damage. So, so the management of the, of the system shouldn't be about uh, once uh, uh, we're in trouble finding the ways to reboot the economy, mm -hmm. hoping, ho hoping that it's going to happen, but really put in place mechanisms which are going to prevent yeah. this uh, burst to happen. Yeah. So in other words, basically a view of economic stabilization, mm -hmm. which is more, the, more than just a, a, an obsession with consumer price inflation. Okay? That, that, that for, economic for economic stability to be achieved, you really need a consistently counter-cyclical counter macro-financial policies. This is, this is the basic thrust of the, of the book. And so now, for smaller economies, this is a greater challenge mm -hmm. because you are now already partially open. And so this is where, for example, the role of capital controls becomes important. But it is not just capital controls. There are other kinds of mechanisms which need to be introduced to basically engage with the world economy in ways which are potentially beneficial but are also protective. Mm -hmm. And this is this this depends, of course, on 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 national circumstances. There's no one size fits yeah. on uh, fits all formula for for for, for, mm -hmm. the, for this purpose. And and so 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 uh, at the at the at the global level, so you are calling for constantly um, uh, counter cyclical uh, uh, measures. So policies, in, institutions, yeah. instruments. So yes. in, in in concrete terms, for instance, in in terms of policies, what you know, give us an example. Of what would be a consistent way to to address this, uh, the, the, the the problem. When you have a s an uh, when you have a, an economic boom, mm -hmm. uh, rather than making more money cheaply available, mm -hmm. you would want to make less money yeah. uh, available uh, at higher cost, especially for for those who would be involved in spec speculative okay. type yeah. activities. Okay. For the institutions, what would be uh, because uh, so uh, what would be uh, uh, the changes needed for the institutions to play uh, a role along these policies? Well, um, the central bank, for example, plays a very important role uh, in uh, in influencing the supply of money, uh, and it would it would need to have as its core mandate this counter-cyclical role. Mm -hmm. It would need to have a strong commitment to, uh, to uh, have, uh, trying to achieve a full employment. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as full employment is achieved, it must not give in to the temptation of, of trying to have uh, uh, maximum growth uh, at, at, at without, without uh, being prudent. Uh, in terms of the kinds of policies you would want to. And then to, to achieve this, you would need to have uh, 
a, a, a toolbox mm -hmm. of instruments which would allow you to to manipulate uh, as your as your economic circumstances mm -hmm. allow. What is possible for a relatively small economy uh, is very different from what would be possible in a big economy. What is possible in a relatively developed economy will be very different from what is possible in a less developed economy. So, so the, the tools have to be uh, conceived by uh, the public intellectuals and then they have to be implemented by the political leadership. Then, so then on the political front, how do we make sure that uh, people in charge, uh, first of all, understand what is at stake and second of all, uh, have uh, enough leadership to make it uh, to make these changes happen because clearly you know this requires uh, uh, for political leaders to be on board and so far yeah. they haven't been on board well this is why this uh, so-called Bretton Woods moment or Keynesian moment was so important because during that but it was only a moment it was a moment yes unfortunately it did not last very long but yeah. uh, in so how do we elongate the moment and make it a more durable uh, well, time period. Uh, sometimes there's inertia. Yes. Okay. Uh, and and uh, um, for although the moment in terms of of political action at the leadership level among uh, global leaders through the G20, for example, did not last more than a year or so at the London summit, at the at the Pittsburgh summit, and so on. Um, its effects have lasted a little longer. If you look, for example, at some of the research papers which have come out from the International Monetary Fund, they basically challenge their old dogmas. They basically are challenging many of the things they were, they were doing uh, and many of the things they were advocating in the past. Of course, there is a change of personnel, which is not unimportant, but it is also the fact that the old dogmas have been so fundamentally challenge and expose that it is very difficult to carry on with business as usual mm -hmm. and that creates an intellectual space that creates an analytical space to open up questions of course some of us would like that whole process to go much further than it has gone mm -hmm. but it has opened up a very very important space and so now you find certain certain uh, economists for example who did not get all that much prominence before the crisis they get more airtime. They are on on public television. They are on. Uh, they, they they you find that their their pieces uh, their op ed pieces uh, in the in the serious media are, are more frequent and so on and so forth. Now, to be sure, this process is moving on, yeah. and this is already beginning to diminish. But that space has opened up, and it will be very difficult to just to go back to business as usual. Uh, before the crisis. So the, qu the question then becomes how much space will be opened up. And I, 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 uh, there, there was, for example, uh, last year, a very interesting uh, cross-Atlantic debate uh, where uh, uh, the United States, President Obama, uh, seemed to be still willing to take more reflationary uh, I initiatives compared to, uh, uh, to, 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 to Europe um, and that it also opened up a certain, uh, certain space um, and to be sure uh, many of the discussions now are not just the discussions of the past uh, revisited we are now seeing some very small but important changes uh, in the discussions uh, uh, today for uh, yesterday for example uh, uh, the new head of the IMF has announced. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, she has announced uh, a number three in the IMF. Uh, 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 Dr. Jumin uh, is going to uh, is going to be. Who is a Chinese national? Is a Chinese national, f formerly vice governor of the People's Bank of China, which is the central bank of China, uh, and uh, he, he he is going to be the third uh, uh, managing. Uh, sorry, the second deputy managing director after the, the American, mm -hmm. who, who, who will be appointed uh, fairly soon to replace uh, Mr. Lipsky, who's, yes. who has already uh, given notice mm -hmm. of his imminent uh, retirement. So, so it's, 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 it's not hopeless? 
it is not hopeless, but at the same time, I don't. I, I mean, I, for, you don't uh, want to be uh, too optimistic. earlier yeah. I was trying to remind you that there is a silver lining to yes. the cloud. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I don't want to to grasp at straws. Okay. And my fear is that the very success of recovering quickly yes. from what was, uh, in some ways, a more serious crisis than in 1929, uh, the very success in turning things around um, meant that that moment was too brief and uh, we, we, we have not seen the, the strengthening of the, the, the intellectual forces mm -hmm. and so on. But so this, uh, this economic crisis is not over. I mean, have we truly turned the corner? Because, I mean, the level of unemployment is still very, very high in Europe and the US. In the US, it's uh, 9.2, something like this, uh, as of uh, July 2011. And then, you know, we have uh, this uh, major issue of, uh, of the sovereign debt in Europe. So how does it fit in the picture? Uh, no, no we, we are certainly not out of the woods and as we discussed earlier, we have a situation where uh, the developed economies have more or less resigned themselves to very slow growth, uh, which will be sustained by the uh, commitment uh, which uh, uh, the, political, uh, the politicians seem to have to fiscal austerity. So, um, uh, I mean, ironically, it was the earthquake and tsunami in Japan mm -hmm. which reversed this, which resulted in greater public uh, 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 spending uh, temporarily. At least uh, in Japan? In Japan, mm -hmm. yeah. Just, but, and also very temporarily. It's yes. not clear how long this will last. Uh, and it is in the developing countries where you have a stronger recovery effort. But uh, because developing countries have become so externally oriented, it is very difficult for them to grow without being able to export. Mm -hmm. And uh, the developed countries also do not want, to, uh, also want to export to grow. Uh, so, so this is the dilemma. We cannot, we, uh, we, we have a situation where grow, future growth is, is really not, uh, not uh, uh, possible because of the circumstances uh, the rich countries, governments have decided to, to, to get themselves into. It is not that we cannot grow out of this. We can recover. For example, there is a huge underinvestment, for example, in renewable energy. There's huge underinvestment uh, in food agriculture. Um, there, there's huge underinvestment in, in infrastructure uh, in, uh, in, many, in most developing countries. And in fact, uh, even in some developed countries where the infrastructure mm. is very old. Including or, the US. Yes. Or if you look at the energy infrastructure, we could we could have a, a we could you, this crisis could be a significant shift away from fossil fuel energy uh, towards renewable energy, for example. Of course, some of this needs to be subsidized a little bit, but uh, only through learning by doing and economies of scale are we going to be able to 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 uh, to accelerate the process and yet this is not the mood of the time because at the moment we're we are focusing on the debt on the need uh, to really go about uh, fiscal austerity i mean you know reducing spending and so on and so on yes. so how do you reconcile the two And, and then the other question is, you know, somehow uh, the, 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 the sovereign debt is partly uh, the, the product of uh, uh, unchecked uh, borrowing and spending and so on and so on. Well, most of the foreign debt, or most of the increase, the recent increase in the sovereign debt, yeah. sorry, is due to borrowing to bail out the financial institutions. So, but isn't it paradoxical? Because in the end, you know, who is paying for this? No, this. I mean, you, you you raised this dilemma earlier, and it's a very unfortunate situation. But just imagine, just imagine, do you, if if uh, when uh, Roosevelt, uh, when he got reelected to his second term, he he promised to balance the budget, and the U.S. went back into recession. Mm -hmm. It was unacceptable in those days, and to Roosevelt's credit, remember yeah. the New Deal mm -hmm. started in '33 before Keynes comp published his g yeah. general theory. Mm -hmm. He didn't wait for the, <laughs> for the economists to publish the ideas to justify the policy. No, he, he, it was that kind of political leadership which you had in those days. But today, political leadership is, 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 uh, is handcuffed.
by financial markets. But I mean, you know, isn't uh, in the end, you know, based on what you are telling me, you know, somehow there is no accountability for for the financial markets. There, 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 it is, there is accountability. The accountability is to, to the principal shareholders who are often themselves. Yeah, but I mean, uh, so it's... Uh, uh, yes, but... They, uh, they, they, look at, they, they look at themselves in the mirror and then they, they, they want to like what they see. And, and, but, you know, what about... Uh, you but know, as, as you know, much, you know I, we don't have time to discuss yes. this, but part of the problem in Europe, which is where, which is the... the core of the problem today mm -hmm. is because of the complications of the eurozone yes yeah and and the dealing of you know the the, the incompatibility of of uh, of having a common monetary policy but uh, no fiscal integration uh, yeah. yes yeah so you have a, 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 a very very difficult situation which is unsustainable so precisely uh, how do you see things evolving well what's the end game I, in all this in, in europe I must admit that I I don't understand European politics uh, well enough, uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, the the desire to 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 create uh, to build a new Europe, uh, which may be very legitimate and understandable, uh, has overtaken. Uh, uh, I mean, you cannot be a member of the European Co Union uh, anymore without uh, uh, signing up for the euro. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a, a straitjacket uh, uh, imposed by the euro, uh, and then you have the roots of 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 uh, problems uh, created by this great uh, variety of, of fiscal circumstances, and uh, I think the 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 the, the the gurus, the high priests of Europe, uh, really have to go back to the drawing board, and uh, but to change the rules of the game in the middle of the game are extremely difficult. difficult. So I do not envy, uh, you know, the European dilemma. You know, in a way, you see, all these issues are the underpinnings of of justice at the global level because if you don't have uh, this uh, international system somehow uh, expressing and carrying on. You know the, the 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 principles that you mentioned. In the end, it's the possibility of economic justice at the global level through economic stability, which is not a possibility, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. well, well, is there something that you would want to? Uh, is there a link that you would want to stress uh, when it comes to uh, the, 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 the 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 need to reform the international system and the demands of economic justice at the global level? No, partly because of the times we live in, and partly because of the recent publication of this book. There are other dimensions of justice which we did not really mm -hmm. uh, discuss very, uh, very much. I mean, there are, for example, the trade elements. Mm -hmm. You know, the, how how does the international trading system perpetuate and contribute to, to uh, inequality at the global level and, and injustice at the global level? How do recent trends, for example, uh, uh, the strengthening of property rights, including uh, this uh, fic this notion of of uh, intellectual property rights uh, contribute to inju uh, injustice. How mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, what economists call a so-called functional distribution of income between uh, capital, uh, labor, uh, and and uh, rentiers and so on and so forth. How how has that changed uh, in recent decades? Uh, there there has been some very interesting work, for example, done by. The late uh, uh, Scottish uh, economist uh, living in Paris, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Angus Madison, who who points uh, who who argued that uh, there was uh, you know uh, there were in, uh, uh, inequalities um, significant inequalities within many societies, but between regions uh, there was very little. Uh, uh, major inequality until about uh, two centuries ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, un five centuries ago it began to increase, but the big increase happened about two centuries ago with the Industrial Rev Revolution. And then uh, this continued to increase until World War II. And after World War II, until the time of the end of Bretton Woods, uh, that means basically the 50s, 60s, uh, you, you found a decline of inequality, unprecedented. Uh, 
and then uh, after that an increase again. Again, yes. And then uh, recently uh, there is the possibility of a new decline, mm -hmm. uh, but a de new decline on the basis of the greater uh, poverty of, of of the rich countries. Of the, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, not because of the significant improvement in the poor countries. And mm -hmm. th this is part of the dilemma which we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So th these are uh, 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 elements of economic uh, injustice and, and then there has been in the last two decades uh, a fascination with so-called silver bullets. Mm -hmm. you know some magic solution which would solve the problem of uh, of of uh, of poverty for example mm -hmm. uh, so called microcredit for example or bottom of the pyramid marketing or strengthening of of uh, land property rights and so on and so forth these were all magic bullets uh, which were which were touted by uh, uh, by by individuals and and by by some some very influential uh, world leaders, um, which unfortunately have not really uh, done very much yes. to address the problem. So I I if we if we wanted to be more comprehensive in trying to to tackle the link between uh, the financial system, economics, and 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 global justice in in economic terms, the global level, we we would need also to tackle the issue of trade and fairness of trade. We would need to really think about uh, property rights, mm -hmm. uh, what you call functional distribution of of uh, of, of, uh, of income. Yeah. Of income. I, I was talking th thinking of the income within countries. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, every in economists have this so-called system of national in of, of national accounts, and mm -hmm. and we look at different types of income. And most of the time when we talk about inequality, we talk about inequality between individuals yes. or between households. Mm -hmm. But it is useful also to look at you know, uh, whether labor is getting more or less. And the idea uh, is that in fact nowadays labor is getting less. Labor That's is getting one of less. the trends of the past decades. Uh, not only is labor getting less, finance is getting more. Yeah, no, yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So th these are very recent trends which we... Which, uh, which are very we, important. Yeah. Most most of the time, unfortunately, when income inequality is talked about, they look at the personal or household, mm -hmm. which is of course important. Yes. But uh, this this other trend is something which I, I hope uh, we economists would pay far more attention to. Yeah. Yeah. So th these are some of the things which we will need to think about in terms of justice, because there's the justice at the global level. Mm -hmm but also there's a level, there's justice at the national level. And so you can have uh, some of the advocates of justice at the global level yeah. who may be very retrogressive when it comes to, 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 the, the, to national level. But, but you would still say that, I mean, you know, getting the international financial system, uh, financial system right is, is one of the conditions for really uh, putting in place uh, economic policies at the global level which are going to be at the same time effective and relatively fair. Uh, if we don't get this right, you know, it's difficult to really uh, uh, go forward, right? Oh yes, absolutely. This is so one, a very important part. But as you correctly yeah, pointed out, yeah. uh, trade is not unimportant. Yeah. Yes. And and uh, there are many uh, exist uh, still existing mythologies yes. about uh, you know that somehow or other, if you increase your productivity, your income will go up, which, uh, is, not which is not necessarily the case. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, farmers increase their productivity, but the price of food went down. Yes. And now we have a cruel dilemma of whether to increase the the, the incomes of the farmers or the increase uh, the, the the welfare of the consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it seems that one has to be at the expense of the other. Uh, we are quite comfortable to say, uh, let us have cheap energy uh, because we don't want a few uh, rich oil companies to get rich or a few countries to get rich. But when it comes to food, it's a much more tricky question. So, so uh, it seems that it's very, very difficult to, to, to put in place, I mean, to, first of all, to envision policies and to put in place policies which would only have winners. I mean, you know, uh, is it always, is it, is it, is it unavoidable to, to, to have, uh, to deal constantly with these dilemmas? Yes. Or can we but conceive economic policies, financial policies, which would only create winners? Well, this is what, what was the great success of Keynesianism. And why it had Keynes? I mean, Keynes himself was uh, was a member of the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. and his greatest uh, influence 
was not on social democrats. It was on the old style conservatives, you know, on 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 people like Erhard in 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 Germany, on Macmillan, and so on and so forth. Uh, so he, while he had influence among uh, strong influence among social democrats, he also had strong influence among the old style of conservatives. Those kinds of conservatives hardly exist these they days. Don't exist anymore. Yeah, and uh, and uh, I'm not even sure that the the, the Keynesian social democrats exist. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they are very small and and fast, uh, uh, fa uh, fast uh, mm -hmm. uh, disappearing minority. Yeah, I mean the, the irony is that we are supposed to live in information and knowledge societies, and yet the level of, of critical thinking seems to have diminished uh, dramatically in the past uh, decades. Unfortunately, you're right.